Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Ask yep. away, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the little iron one? Oh, there, there we go. Uh, oh, they're already there. Okay. Oh, so we should drop the. Uh, now, this is the first one where we've had the questions doc page. We should drop that into the. Uh, sure. I I mean, uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, all right. First question is about Java. Java Service Fabric is in preview. When is it expected for GA? Um, so, Java Service Fabric is in preview for Linux. So, it's. It's probably several months away at this point, so I, we don't have exact dates, but it's going to be several months out. Okay. And the next question is related to that .NET standard 2.0 support for SDK. Probably around the same time, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Probably going to be around the same time. Uh, and related to that open source in the SDK, that's coming up real soon now. Um, uh, uh, that was cool. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open sourcing SDK is coming up soon. Open sourcing the rest of Service Fabric TBD. <laughs> yeah, that's a there's a lot there. Okay. Uh, all right. What's the recommended way to validate that a stateless service came online properly on the node before rolling forward to the next node? Health. And implement your own health checks and report uh, report health. I think your your hands on that as a good example. Yeah, there's a there's a lab on the blog. It's on the second or third page now. Um, look for lab part one, and it shows you how to build a stateless with health, and it shows how to do an upgrade and what happens if an upgrade fails. Well, we, yeah, rolling forward to the next node. Yeah, that's that's all health. So yeah. this is generally something where you just report health. And then Service Fabric takes care of making sure that things are healthy before the upgrade moves and on. The more health you do, the better you're going to be. <laughs> when you say rolling forward to the next node, I'm assuming you mean during an upgrade. Yeah, I don't. This is not a manual. Probably not a. Yeah. Yeah, not a deployment time thing, but a, but an upgrade. Did we lose a question there? Yeah. There was a question about when. Oh. oh yeah, Java SDK on Windows. Well, that's also probably going to be around the same time. Yeah, so same suppose, time. Yeah. Yeah. So suppose we're going to uh, GA Java on Linux around the same time. We should have something on Windows as well. Yeah. It's probably several months out. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're just going to be standard. I'm just, I'll just stay here. Okay. Yeah. It was about automatic well, updates. There's a, there's a blog that Chaco yeah, did. Yeah. Um, I think it's the second or third on the page right now. that gives a timeline for updates, and there's a service out now that can run to do installation of patching in a safe way. Um, and you'll see the roadmap for the rest of that on, on the blog. It's the best place to go to. Yes. So today you, you do get Windows updates automatically via that tool. Automatically meaning you have to run that tool. Um, that's just something that we put out there to, to work through making sure that you can patch your VMs while we wait for the image-based patching to come from VM scale sets which are underneath us. So hopefully in the next few months the VM scale sets will solve the problem for us. Summer. Summer, yeah, is the current time frame. Um, and that point image-based patching will start to work where you won't be applying the patches with Windows Update in the guest. You'll just get a new OS image and that'll roll out. Um, but it's not there yet. Cool. All right, so Sean posted a link. We have this. Uh, we put up a frequently asked questions page here that you guys can take a look at. These are questions that we get almost every uh, almost every time we do one of these sessions. So have a look through that. Um, and I think VM patching is in here. there as well as a couple other things. Yeah, yeah VM patching, uh, cross region clusters, all that stuff is covered in there. So have a look at that. There, and let us know if you think anything is missing. So here's another Java question. Can you guys read those by the way? Yeah. Okay. okay. So it looks like they're doing Java and considering using document DB to store actor state rather than just by default. How should we go about doing this? They've considered creating their own implementation of state provider or having an actor with state persistence set to none and on activate sync, loading the actor state from the database. Best practices or directions. Honestly, I don't know how pluggable the state manager is for actors today. You'd probably end up having to drop down to the actor service level and then doing some interesting stuff there. Um, in order to get that to work, you could do that. Yeah. It's pluggable, but it it would be a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I'd be curious to know why you're considering using DocDB to store the actor state. Presumably, it's because there are some features in DocDB that you don't get from the actor framework. So using DocDB as a backing store, like writing a state provider using DocDB, I'm not sure how much you'd get out of that. Um, but if you want features from DocDB, then you wouldn't use a state provider. You just write state out to it. Yeah. And in which case, yeah, I guess you would just do persistent state none. Yep. 
and that essentially just gives you one replica. So we're not doing any state replication. And your actors can just write. The thing is, if you do state persistence none, you still get um, you still get unique IDs for each actor. So every time you query an actor, you know you're talking to the same one. So you can use the ID as maybe a key in document or something like that. But that's, that's probably the way I'd yeah, We'd like to know what you're, what you're interested in using DocDB as the backing tool for. Yeah. That's probably, if I had to guess, I'd say it's queries or things like that. But you can yeah. tell us, um, and we can maybe see if that, that influences the answer. Yeah. What's this link, John? Oh, patching VMS. Yes. yes. Great. Yes. Good. Cool. Uh, common question pages, fantastic. All right. All right. Uh, stateful, stateful service run, stateful run async cancellation, and stateless run async cancellation get highlighted in the OMS solution as notable issues, though their information level events. Should I be paying attention to this? The red on the donut chart is making me nervous. That's interesting. I don't know why those would be showing up in OMS. Yeah. And normally, those would only show up in, in the service network health sense um, if your service was not responding to that cancellation token in a reasonable amount of time. That is a bug that we've, we've seen a lot, but you should be seeing similar health events saying that your run async is taking longer to shut down or close async is stuck um, as Service Fabric Health messages in Service Fabric Explorer. So if you're not seeing the similar message in, in, in health. I think it's more of an OMS limitation. Yeah. There's specific events that OMS consumes, yeah. and it doesn't know about anything else. Yeah. So this is something we can go back to the OS, OMS team and say this is causing some confusion for people. Sure, but it, it could be a, it could be either a false yeah, positive or Yeah, you should look at other things. Yeah, look, yes. at, look at Service Fabric Explorer, see if there's a health message there. Service Fabric would put up a message saying your closed async is stalled or run async is stalled. Um, if it's not responding to that, that close call, you could also just, on your local development box, start running chaos or do an upgrade or delete your service. All of those um, paths would also trigger the same cancellation token. Um, and, and so hopefully you'll see that you either do or don't have a problem. There. The other thing you can see is the OMS solution pulls the events from the Azure table. So you can always go into the tables and look at the events around that to see if you see any other errors. So when he's talking about the red on the donut chart, he's talking about in OMS. OMS. In OMS. Not, not in SFX. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. We don't have any donuts. Well, we do. Well, we, we do, right? Yeah. The very first well, thing it's you see. Donut. Donut. I guess it's a donut with a bite out of it. It's a donut with a bite out of it. It's a delicious donut. It's a delicious donut. It's a delicious, it's delicious donut. Yeah, there you go. Go! <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I hope that answers, hope that answers your questions. <laughs> That's all you need to know about donuts. Well, I have a lot about donuts. Some of the donuts will be in the back, yeah. You brought donuts last time, right? No, this time. Oh, right. Whatever. Whatever. Okay. We don't have tingles um, This is starting to happen again. Yeah, it's good. Right. It's good. It's okay. Another it's OMS. Right. This is another OMS question. Do you know when there will be support for OS level performance metrics to OMS? Um, Today we only have so application level logging. You can do. Uh, you should look at the Azure monitoring solution. Um, I'm going to publish a new article on end to end monitoring probably the end of next week that'll address this. But go look at Azure monitoring and all the infrastructure counters flow into Azure Monitoring, and then they can flow from Azure Monitoring into OMS uh, in an automatic way. But you get the last seven days of infrastructure counters from each of the nodes in Azure Monitoring basically for free. Um, so please take a look at that and see if that helps you out. There's gotta, yeah. be, there's yeah, gotta yeah, be an easier way. <laughs> It's just not, it's just not copying. Copy. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we should look at them on our computer and then we can keep the list. Well, I, I'm going to try and copy them. There's got to be a better way. What's next? I'm trying to look for it. Can you see it? Yeah, okay. Can Service Fabric Reverse Proxy be configured to use some kind of affinity of stickiness? If you want to expose one of our API, with WebSocket signal R, which requires some level of affinity. Um, okay, well, if you're doing if you're doing affinity, then the state that you need for the affinity, like if you're using signal R and doing a a backplane for signal R, that would actually be kept in a stateful service. So you should know from the front end, from the client, um, either what service to go to, what partition of the service to go to to get your state. So if it's a backplane or if it's session state. Or anything, anything that needs to be sticky. That's 
that's specific to a partition of a stateful service. So as long as the client knows that, the reverse proxy will always forward it to the same partition of the same stateful service. So it's not so much that you're asking the reverse proxy to always go to the same machine or the same node. You're not doing that. But it will, just by design, it will send you to the same partition of the same stateful service as long as you ask for that partition. So you're doing, uh, you're doing a request with a partition key that you determine. As long as you send the same partition key to the same staple service in the back, then yeah, it'll always go to the same place. So that's sort of by design. Yeah, that should work just fine. Um, it's not quite a sticky session. It's just sort of the way staple services work. Or semantic stickiness. Semantic yeah. stickiness. Yeah, there you go. Right. That's a good way to put it. The next question is, we had an issue on our cluster. One of the nodes had an OS level network issue. So it's fabric itself marked system dot something service with the yellow mark and didn't direct request to the node. While requests within the deployed app were still routed to a service replica on the node using remoting, so requests were constantly failing. What's the recommended way of handling this issue? I think we probably need to know more about the, the failure. Usually network failures will result in the node itself getting uh, kicked out, so it, it would the node would shut down, and then once the network issue heals itself, the node comes back. So if you're saying that the, the node was you know not down, um, then it's more of a network gray out where there's some sort of transient blip or things like that that might impact your application. Um, if the node actually did go down because of the network issue and you were still seeing requests get routed there, then that sounds like a communication service resolution uh, naming issue. So, we, I mean, it could be a couple of things. So figuring out more, if you guys, if you want to contact us maybe after the Q&A, um, we can look more at the, the details of that particular issue. Um, and see what happened. But basically, I would expect if the network failure is severe, the, the node to go down, and then the, the service would fail over to a different location, naming would pick it up, and, and your calls would end up getting routed to that other location. So if you weren't seeing that, either there's a problem in the communication or the node wasn't really down, um, we can figure out what, what happened there. May I comment on this? Good, good candidate to post on our GitHub issues page yeah. um, so we can have, have more of an in-depth look at it. What are the plans for service fabric on Linux for on-prem? Yes, we have plans. <laughs> but, uh, can, hey guys, yeah. can we back so, up yeah, for a minute? It will be several months out, but we do plan to support on-prem and Azure for Linux as well. I think Dimitri was uh, trying to give you some you additional guys information. Thank you on the DocDB persisted actors. We are mainly doing this for secondary key lookups and data accessibility. Is our right to database idea the best option to gain secondary key lookups? I mean, there's pros and cons, right? That, that's certainly a, a pretty straightforward answer. Um, you do get some good query stuff out of DocDB, where you can look at your data. It's persisted in this JSON doc format. Um, it's, it's a pretty good solution for that type of thing. I'd say it depends on what you really are doing the, the secondary key lookups for. If it's cold, in the sense that you're not trying to do it online as a part of your services running day-to-day, second-by-second business, um, then using it as a cold store and then doing that ad hoc kind of query thing later is um, pretty common. Um, if it's more like hot data where you need uh, that information to be some sort of index and to look it up you know, uh, all the time, um, you might consider looking at uh, moving the, the data from an uh, actor model to the reliable services model. The reliable services model would let you have multiple collections, multiple dictionaries, um, and you could effectively have multiple keys in those different dictionaries. So a message comes in, and it's you know uh, indexed by you know first name. So Matt, the message ID in Matt goes in one dictionary, and the message ID in some other metadata about time it showed up or something like that, that goes in the other dictionary. Um, and that way you have multiple indexes built. Um, the the dictionaries also have kind of a, an indenting mechanism so that you can know when data inside them changes. So every single time you committed a new message to uh, the dictionary, if you don't really care about that other data being persistent, uh, you'd get that notification and you could add it to a normal C-sharp in-memory dictionary or a list or a queue or a tuple or something else, and then keep that as your in-memory index. So depending on exactly what you're using it for, if you need it to be super hot um, and you're going to be getting you know, thousands of these are going to be getting updated all the time and you want them uh, kept consistent inside the service plane, um, then doing it with reliable services might be a way to do it. 
if it's colder offline analytic stuff, dumping into DocDB is, is a perfectly great solution. Um, I guess it's also the question about whether or not you know, it's, it's complexity, so you would have to build some more code in order to get the indexing in your services, versus DocDB gives it to you for free. Um, the other thing is that DocDB is, of course, a separate service that you're calling into, so now you have that dependency. Um, if anything were to happen to DocDB, you have to might think about kind of the reliability of your data or what you're going to do when you can't contact DocDB because the network's wiped out or DocDB is having a blip or something like that. Um, so those are all considerations. Um, what we end up doing kind of depends on, on your answers to those questions. Nick Dorby thanks us for the donut-related bits. <laughs> and uh, Dimitri, I can't see the board. Did yeah, but yeah. The board. yeah, I was wondering. I was trying to say. There. Oh, there's the yeah. percent. Can you can you guys hear us? The what screen? The percent screen. Oh, percent screen. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. 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 It's a I, I don't think yeah. they can. That's That's not not that I don't think they can either. <laughs> Maybe right. if you dialed in right. to the or something. Yeah, let me check direct. Hang on. Is there a way to override values in the service manifest direct somehow? I see the way to override the values in the settings settings somehow. Uh, there's no way to override most of the settings inside of the service manifest itself today. That is something that we're working on. Um, in particular, we're working on that so that um, we've been doing a lot of work with um, environment variables for configuring containers, command line args for launching various guest exes. That's all stuff that we want to be parameterizable um, so that you could inject it the same way that you inject settings into settings.xml. Um, we also want to make things like port configurable and, and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's all stuff that, that we're looking at, but yeah, not today. Um, there's another question on OS patching, but I think Sean replied to that, to that link. So please take that link for patching your OS along with any anti-malware software that you want on the VMs. Travis asks, what is the largest cluster that you have run? Practically speaking, are there upper bounds on the number of nodes, service instances, partitions, etc., before the management services for a single cluster or all of them? We love to hear customers asking, how big? Yeah, how big is my cluster? Uh, so we've never actually found an upper limit. Um, we, we've tried. Can you guys just uh, answer and mine? Really, what happened was we got to about a thousand nodes, and that's also one of the larger ones that we know of that's in production. Um, and no one has a workload that's bigger than that, or a single workload that they wanted to run in a single cluster. Uh, that's been bigger than that. So that's about the, the top practical, there's no limit, it's just the most that we've ever seen uh, run for any period of time. Um, as far as the number of services and things like that, that's a much harder question, um, and that's going to really depend upon what the services are. So we've gotten you know tens of thousands of services running on a single node, but those services weren't doing anything. They were empty, they were cold, they were just kind of sitting there. Um, so that's kind of what we've tested up to. No real production workload that we're aware of runs at that sort of density. Usually services, because they're loading the CLR, they're loading other dependencies that they're having, they're loading you're all still, their other You're still sharing physical resources. Yeah, you're still, you're still physically constrained. 10,000 things sharing a couple CPU cores. A couple CPU cores isn't going to work, happy. right? Yeah. yeah. So in practicality, we've seen services top out usually at around a couple hundred or a few hundred per node. That's not a service fabric limit, it's just physics. Uh, that's all that fits. Um, usually then the number of services that you can get into a cluster depends a lot on the number of nodes you have, how many you can fit on a given node, and also kind of how hot they are, how much work they're doing. Um, unfortunately, there's no single number that we can say is, a, is an upper bound. Um, I've seen you know, clusters of medium size with five or 600 services in it, so not very dense. I've also seen thousands and thousands, you know, up to tens of thousands of services running in some medium-sized clusters. So it really will depend upon the actual workload, how beefy the machines are, the density levels that you can get, that sort of stuff. Um, the only one that we can put a hard number on is, is number of nodes in a cluster in there. We've, we've tested up to 1,000. If your workload is bigger than 1,000 nodes, please call us. Uh, we would love to hear what you're uh, because that, that's sure, certainly going to be some interesting stuff. Yeah. And thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, how do we view what is registered in the image store besides using PowerShell? You should be able to look that up using the Fabric Explorer. So, uh, just uh, right. not in the Explorer today. The rest APIs, the rest APIs do exist. Yeah, um, but it's not do doable in Explorer today. We don't you, have not well. There's it depends on what you mean by in the image store. Yeah. So there's kind of two okay. ways of looking at the image store. There's the raw like packages that you've uploaded to the image store, which are kind of transient, like the in yeah. path and image store um, stuff. You, you can see that mainly through PowerShell and, and the REST APIs. If you wanted to look at 
all the registered types that you have, those are also kept actually in the image store. Um, those you would see yeah, yeah. in Service Fire Explorer because you will see uh, the, the application types, the service types, all the packages, all the config versions, all that stuff. Um, but generally, but, there's really no reason to actually go into the image store. On you know, yeah, sorry. Generally, 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 you shouldn't it's have not, to There's not a whole lot in there to see. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting stuff, like seeing what's registered, as Matt said, that we display that's, that information. Yeah, yeah, that's the most common stuff. Oh. Um, Mark, Mark walked in and I sneezed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's okay. <laughs> Hello to Mark. Yes. Uh, so I, just, I don't know if there was a comment by the way of following the chat or not. Uh, yeah, if I'm questions sure. are being missed, please repost them because we're trying to read them off on uh, yeah. Windows. Yeah. Um, so this is a follow-up to the earlier question. I know, but in OMS they said they cannot digest OS perf counters through Azure tables yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, they, they might not be. They're, they're yeah. only able to do certain things with OMS today. Um, so, but again, look at Azure Monitoring. Um, it's a free service. It comes. It's in the portal, and you can look at all those infrastructure counters. Yeah. What are the plans of development for my favorite reverse proxy? Uh, <laughs> for oh, reverse proxy, not server so, proxy. Yeah. Favorite reverse <laughs> proxy? So Nginx or the one that we should. <laughs> Clearly the one that we should. Yeah. Um, development plans. So we're working on a few things. Um, we're working on allowing you to do SSL all throughout your services. So rather than just SSL termination, we'll do SSL pass through other services. Um, and then and then the other thing we're still kind of designing is how to whitelist, uh, be able to whitelist services. So you get to choose which of your services are exposed through the reverse proxy and which ones aren't. Um, and we're still kind of going back and forth on the right design for that. Uh, so those are the two big things to look forward to right now. Uh, and there's been quite a few feedbacks on the GitHub issues around reverse proxy catering different types of headers and things like that. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. That we've got to really need fixing. So yeah, bug fixes, bug fixes. fixes. Yeah. Yeah. Works quite a bit. So yeah. um, if I wanted to host a MongoDB cluster or some other database cluster on nodes across Service Fabric today, what is the best way to go about hosting the data for the cluster across the nodes? That's question number one. Yeah, so it's really going to depend upon what that other data store is and whether or not it natively kind of understands replication or whether it has its own notion of replicas. Um, if it's something like a, like a Mongo or Cassandra or Redis or something like that that does have the notion of replication, um, either you're going to have to figure out how to uh, read the configuration information out of Service Fabric so you can configure those different replicas as they come up on different machines, uh, that's probably the most natural way to do it. The more involved way to do it would be to actually um, take those data stores and somehow port them to use the replication capabilities that are present in Service Fabric themselves. We haven't seen anybody yeah, do that yet, but that's a, yeah, that's a much, <laughs> yeah, that's a much more involved thing. But yeah. the API is there. Um, usually, it's just getting it configured correctly so that when a, you know when the Mongo replica starts up on a machine, it can find the other Mongo replicas, has the same configuration and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two things. I mean, we, we have an article published on this, but it only shows you how to do a single replica Mongo database. So you deploy, there's a guest executable, there's a single Mongo database that gets deployed, there's a guest executable and it comes up. But the hard part is getting the replication right. Uh, we probably should go and try it, but one of the things that made it a bit easier is we support environment variables now that you can configure as part of your service. So if you can set a set of environment variables to here's the other, um, here's how you configure your Mongo database when it starts up, then that will probably make it easier. So we should probably try and dig into that a bit more. Yeah. Uh, VM scale sets currently don't support data disks. When they do, would your recommendation change? Uh, not really, because it really does depend upon how that data store works and whether or not it understands, or it, it can get enough information just to find the replicas locally. Um, whether you're writing to a local drive or a remote drive at that point is a data durability and performance question, less so of a, of a replication or getting it hooked up into the cluster type question. Can you replace the IOB with an application gateway? Uh, the answer is yes. I think we need to provide some templates. The application load balancer? The application. Oh, you mean the, the Azure load balancer? Yeah. The Azure load balancer. You replace it with an application, with an application gateway. gateway. Yeah. Well, we have uh, seen people who've used the application gateway service as a front end to the other services. But I mean, it's still you know discrete in that you set up the application gateway service to receive all your your requests, and you might do your SSL termination, and then it forwards those requests.
through the Azure Luba, it still, still goes through the VIP, uh, still, still goes through the VIP yeah, yeah, to your backend services around those. I mean, the other thing that we've yeah. seen is using something like Event Hubs or something like that, where the service is actually yeah, reaching right. out into Event Hub or Service Bus or something like that and pulling messages out. So in that case, the, the hub or the, the service bus becomes your application gateway. Clients would put messages or events or operations or whatever into that, and then the services would pull out. And in that case, you're not really using the Azure Load Balancer or Azure App Gateway or API Management or any of those other types of things. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, so yeah they're, they're separate. They're separate resource groups. They're separate deployments and separate uh, yeah. VNs. Separate deployments. The application, yeah. the application gateway service and service fabric as a deployed cluster is still separate deployment for the resource yeah. groups that you hook up to, to VNet. To really get yeah, to really get that hooked up, you you need either something that's in the same VNet, or you yeah. need yeah. Right. Um, something that you need your cluster to somehow expose public IP addresses that were routable, so your clients would effectively be talking directly to the services inside the cluster. As long as that VNet is there, you're basically going to have to have something that can bridge between publicly routable IP addresses and DNS names like you know foo.cloudapp.azure.com uh, and some port. You need something to bridge between that and the internal IP addresses that you get uh, inside the cluster. Whether that's Azure Load Balancer or some or Azure API Management can do th can do things like that. Um, or, or replacing with some sort of. So we continue to work to try and make all those other gateways, whether it's IoT Hub or bring application them a gateway or after yeah. API management, to bring them closer to be integrated with service fabric. So yeah. that is a goal that we will have as we. I mean, presumably, this is about reducing the number of hops that a request has to take before it gets back to your stateful service, right? Because right now it goes through the load balancer, then it has to go through a stateless service, and then it has to be routed back to the stateful service. And then if you also put some API management in front of that, and then you got multiple hops. So I'm guessing this is just about reducing the hops. And we did talk a little bit about this last time. How we're uh, we're working to bring API management um, kind of closer into into a service fabric cluster in Azure, so they're a little more integrated. And in that case, yeah, you can you'll be able to set up APIs through API management, which will then talk directly to services in Staples in in service fabric, because um, the uh, API management will be able to do service resolution, and it'll be able to talk directly to the nodes. Uh, on the back end without going through the Azure load balancer. So that's that's something that's coming. I don't know if there's a way that you'd be able to set that up manually today. I've, I've never seen that done. Um, this week, we are starting to attempt to use the TFS build tool for <coughs> on-prem deployment. Are there any contrails or tips you could share? Um, well, the the task that you can use in BSTS today is usually to do team services. Uh, some of them, I think, actually ship with TFS. I'm not sure how updated they are. There's a sort of a longer release cadence there. Uh, but you can always go and pull down the auto versioning and the deployment task that we have from the BSTS repo, build them yourself, and deploy them to your TFS infrastructure. So basically what they give you is they give you, um, they give you uh, a way of auto versioning your services uh, when you build them and create your application packages. And they give you a way of deploying your applications uh, in sort of one set, uh, one set of tasks. Um, is, is the question about using TFS on-prem or about deploying to an on-prem service fabric cluster? Because if it's deploying to an on-prem service fabric cluster, there shouldn't be any, I mean, as long as you can it's the same. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, well, both. 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 Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Both meaning that both TFS and the clusters on-prem. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So then, yeah. So what I said is still vetted. <laughs> um, you would you would need make make sure that your build agents have the uh, the runtime and the SDK installed. You don't need uh, you don't need Visual Studio to be there uh, on the agent as some other workloads might need. Um, so a couple of guys told like apparently they have been asking follow-up questions. Uh, we were we were on mute earlier because we were getting some echo, but now we, uh, we are no longer on mute, so we should be able to hear follow-up questions. So, sorry. Yeah, if anybody wants can, to give a shout. Can you hear right me now, Manny? Oh, yeah. We're we're right. yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, do you plan to open source some SDK on top of Service Fabric? I have multiple ideas for some libraries built on top of the current Service Fabric that might be useful for a wider audience, and I'm thinking what is the best place to contribute this. Well, okay. the, you go start updating the uh, common questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah the, I mean, the current the current SDK is the Services Framework and the Actor Framework, and so those those will be open soon. Those will be open source fairly soon here. Um, we don't have additional, uh, you know, additional frameworks frameworks or anything on top of that. That that uh, that we can open source. 
if you have frameworks yourself that you can open source, there's a couple things you can do. Obviously, if you have um, if you have changes to our SDK, to the services layer, or the actor layer, we're absolutely going to accept contributions. So please, if you have something, let us know, and we'll we'll get that in there. That's all going to be on GitHub. So just follow the standard uh, GitHub way of doing that. If you have your own framework entirely, though. Um, that would probably be a project of your own that you would host, presumably on GitHub, but under your own account and uh, be run as a separate thing. We can always look at maybe incorporating, you know, community projects into our own SDK. That's something that we can always that we're always open to. Um, but I'd probably say just start as a project of your own, and then we can take a look at it and go from there. A lot of other projects have like a community incubator kind of GitHub mm -hmm. um, umbrella that they put. Things that are not necessarily in the product, but are sort of yeah, somewhat yeah. blessed. We should look at that. Yeah, so that's a good idea too. I think we, we missed a question from Tom. Um, are there plans to add support for on-demand, point-in-time backup restore to Service Fabric? Um, it depends a little bit on, on what you mean by by backup restore. If you're talking about the system services, so you could back up, uh, say, uh, the information in naming or the service, the list of services that are currently created. We don't currently have any plans for that. Um, but there is a uh, plan to do backup and restore for your services. I don't know if that is really a on-demand point-in-time yeah. thing for on-prem today. We're mainly looking at Azure Backup as the first uh, place where we're going to integrate yeah. with that. Yeah. The APIs do exist. Yeah, so there's no reason why you couldn't do it on your own. Now, if you're talking about a point-in-time as an you know, consistent backup across all your services or partitions, then you will have to flush the queue, and you will have to basically take the app offline for you to get that um, uh, get that point. And if that's your definition of point, yeah, if it's a if it's a distributed snapshot is yeah. what you're looking for, that's harder. Yeah, uh, and re requires some some application pause or downtime today, um, where you have to coalesce all the writes and, and then do one big write out to your backup. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a scenario. All of those are scenarios that we're aware of. Yeah, um, I think the the thing to be aware of is. Backup restore APIs do exist. Uh, please, you know, definitely use them to back up the data that you're saving in any stateful services. The, ser the cluster itself is self-rebuilding. So if you shut it down and waited a while and then turned it all back on, um, it would re-bootstrap itself from all of the all of the nodes that were recovered. Um, that's part of the reason why there's no big backup for the service fabric system services themselves. Um, so what you would you, you you your services would just kind of get recreated, but that doesn't save you from oops, right? The oops scenario is the, you know, I accidentally deleted this service or I accidentally removed some yeah. state that I, that I meant to be keeping. And, and you mentioned the service. I mean, Azure Backup and Resource Service exists today where we build a service ourselves yeah. that allows you to write to that, with that individual with that. Yeah, so uh, we are, we're going to be integrating with the Azure Backup and Resource Service so that you can configure backups for your service fabric application for services through the, uh, through the portal. And it's going to be powerful as well. Um, so repeat of the earlier, my laptop is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> repeat of the earlier question is: there a way to override values in the service manifest? Yeah, he, apparently he just missed the answer. Yeah, that's good. Okay. It's not there so, today. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah the answer okay, is so there. just just to follow up there, what I'm having to do then, I think, and just wanted to run the solution by you guys is. In the, as I said, I'm local. Uh, I'm on-prem for TFS and I'm on-prem for my cluster. So what I'm looking at doing is in the task-based build system, I'm going to have multiple environment versions of that service manifest. And on build, I'll replace that file before doing the package so yep. that I can deploy multiple environments. Yep. It's the only I, thing I can think of. Yeah, the only other way to do it is um, depending on what, what exactly you're trying to change, um, you can move it into settings.xml. Um, I don't so think I can do this one. I'm trying to change the endpoint port because I need to host multiple applications yeah. inside okay. of the cluster. So it's yeah. really the web API endpoint so, port. So, so technically really you can. You could, you could put the port inside well, settings.xml. You lose all the configuration that we do on your well, behalf. There's, there's, two, there's two things you can do, actually. So depending on... So you're using web API. Are you doing ASP.NET Core? Um, I'm actually doing a service fabric uh, stateful service that I'm exposing to other web applications that are in IIS on, you know, just normal um, 2012 servers. They need to call the service fabric service. So this is web API is just to expose the service fabric service for an external call. For an external so, call. Oh, 
So every service fabric application I create is going to yeah. have a port every, like I'm sharing a, uh, you know, I'm going to have multiple branches on the same cluster. I'm not wanting to create a three server cluster for each development branch. So, the, you know, as I deploy dev A, dev B, dev C, dev D, these are all different development branches. I need a different endpoint for each of those. So I'll have a different port for each of those. So I need to be able to override it. It's a, you know, it's an environment configuration. Be static. Well, the reason I was asking is because, it, so depending on, depending on the web server you're using inside your staple service for web API, if you're, so if you're doing, if you're doing an IS or HTTP sys based web server like web listener or the older HTTP listener, um, in that case, then yeah, you need you need to put the port into the service manifest so that we can ACL the port for URL. But you do have another option with that web server since you have port sharing. Um, if you're willing to do this, you can use the same port for all of your environments, and all of your services in the same environment, as long as you have a unique URL path because it'll. Allow yeah, it. yeah, so, I could use the controller right and, and right, route right. that way, but I'm trying to avoid that. Um, so you specifically Greg, want different ports. Yeah, Greg. One thing in TFS, there is a uh, there is a thing called a tokenizer task, which is a utility you can you can extend your TFS with to basically just have a tokenizer in your XML file, and then in build you can actually replace the token. Say that again. What was that called? It's called it's called tokenizer. Uh, there's something called release tokenizer. Tasks, okay. Tasks, which is an ex extension to TFS, just to make that easier. Yeah. Okay. So instead okay. of having all the files kind of pre-prepped, you would rewrite them effectively as a part of build. Or it's a token inside yeah. the file. Yeah, there's a token drop inside the file. Oh, yeah. okay, I got you. I you got drop, you. You drop the different port in then. Yeah. Yeah, so and just the, just the, to give you, you know, just to completely overwhelm you with choice, the other thing that you can do is <laughs> you, you can you can put the the port as an option inside settings, and then you have to do kind of the URL ackling yourself as a part of a setup. So you'd have a setup. I'll let you guys port. handle that. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's, here's another choice, too. No, 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 no. If you're doing ASP.NET Core, if you're using Kestrel as your web server, then there's no need to do any of port ackling at all. Uh, and then you don't need to put the port in the service manifest because you don't need us to do anything. That only applies to HTTP sys-based web servers. So if you're using Kestrel, none of it matters, and you can use whatever port you want, and you can put that in settings XML and read it out of there. Yeah. So that's it. That's the other other option. But it's still share ports. But then uh, you, you can't, can't share ports, no. But, but, you, I don't think but it, doesn't, it sounds like you don't want to share ports anyways. It's just making sure for other people. Yeah. Yep. I yeah, think we want to know that we're pointing at what we're pointing at. Um, because yeah. sort of like what you're talking about is having a shared web API across multiple applications. If you're doing it that way, right? You'd have... have port sharing. No, not quite. It's They would all be using the same port. Um, and then you let the HTTP sys kernel driver route calls on your behalf based on the URL path rather than the port. But I guess in this scenario where so, we talk about sort of a staging, you wanna you wanna uh, the reason for not you know having those sit together is because it's like a test dev thing. Yeah. So you probably want a URL possible. like segregation, yeah. not like yeah. a slash test slash dev thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So then use different ports for tokenizer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Tokenizer, by the way, go. Okay. Just heard on the progress of the Linux port. Well, we are in public preview and we're looking at feedback. Um, GA dates are probably going to be several months out. We don't, you know, it's probably sometime in Q3 calendar year this, um, uh, Q3 of this year, calendar Q3. Um, so, but yeah, we release every month, month, yes. But we release every four to six weeks. So, um, we update the release, uh, the SDK and the runtime every four to six weeks. So, nothing more to share that. Always things come. Um, is it possible to run custom code for upgrade validation so I can trigger rollback the code fails? Yes, course. you can. Health checks. Yeah, 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 it's, 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 health checks. yeah, it's really all about health checks. The upgrades, upgrades roll back based on the health reports that are coming either from your service or from the system. So you can run any code you want. All it has to do is issue a health report, and there's an API for that if you're in a service. It's uh, this.partition.reporthealth. Was I think I think there's a number of them. Yeah, there's a number of them. Yeah, that's true. Let's put a link to Todd's lab because he has a specific example of how yeah. to do that. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, there will be better articles starting the end of next week. And the idea behind that is just that yeah, those tests or whatever you're trying to do is validation are running pretty much continuously inside the cluster, and if they get triggered where something bad happens and they report you know a health error during that upgrade, that upgrade will pause, wait to see if that health check clears, and if not, it'll roll back. So. That's really how we think about it. Yeah. Doing. And we did a demo of this at last build, right? Scott Hanselman, the 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah the Age of Ascent. That was yeah. the Age of Ascent demo. If you guys watched that, it was the uh, the space shooter game. We issued, we did an upgrade on it, and then we had code that did some health checks, and that's precisely what we did there. Is custom code issued a health report that said this that the upgrade's in error state, and then Service Fabric automatically rolled it back. The lab has code examples. Yes. Go the lab. When we log and create EGW files, where are those created on the cluster? I can see them in Visual Studio in the viewer, but have have, but have a hard time finding the files on the like cluster. So you have to have a listener that listens to the ETW events and then writes them someplace. Um, this is true for the application, your application level ETW events, and any of the system events um, that we talk about. We have that for support logs. So there's already a listener inside of Service Fabric that writes anything we need for support to wherever you have that configured, whether hosted in Azure or on-premise. But you have to have an equivalent listener to listen to those ETW reports and send them to where you want them to be. I'm assuming you're on-prem. Um, otherwise, Azure would have given you a, a, an article that tells you how to do this. So you need to, you need to install something. Uh, I'd look at event flow. Um, it's brand new. It's uh, Microsoft.diagnostics.eventflow and NuGet packages. And as I keep saying, there'll be a better article at the end of next week. Um, we just let you get out of this room. room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but right now, when, I think what you were asking is like, if I want to write logs locally and look at them locally in some way, what's the easiest choice there? Eventflow. Eventflow. So, so what, what I'm understanding is that it's just not written currently. I have to set up some sort of other application to do that. I was looking at. Um, no, no, I, I guess, it, say that again? Event flow is not another application. You need he has to have something listening. And today there's no output for event flow that will write to the local disk. Okay. He has to send it someplace else anyway. Um, but take, take a look at event flow. It'll help you. You have to have something that listens to those events. Event flow will help you with your application level for on-prem, but you're still going to have to have someplace else to send them to, either Elasticsearch cluster, App Insights, um, something along those lines. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. So I, I recently downloaded Microsoft Message Analyzer, and I believe that would actually allow me to connect and, and listen. It, you can start a, a live trace session with Microsoft Message Analyzer. I hadn't looked at that option. I didn't know it wasn't created. I thought I just couldn't find it. Um, on the Elasticsearch option, um, we're, I'm looking at what I have on site as far as viewing these ETW files. So you can view the system event logs and the application event logs in the same view. Um, have uh, uh, Just a quick question of how hard is it to set up an, an ELK, an Elasticsearch uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I have to set up my own cluster. Is that a ton of work so that I can view my, I mean, I need to see real-time application errors. If my boss says, hey, we're having an issue in production, what's going on? And I say, uh, I have to wait five to ten minutes for Microsoft Message Analyzer to load all of these events. He's not going to like that. Yeah. that that's, that's a game stopper right there. I need, I need real-time events of what's happening in my production environment. I haven't set one up on-prem. Um, it's actually pretty easy to install inside of Azure. And you don't necessarily need to have it, like you can use an Elasticsearch in Azure. I, I mean, maybe you have security concerns where you can't have anything in the cloud. Um, but Currently I can't have, do a, anything. Okay, so it shouldn't actually be that hard to set up an Elasticsearch cluster. And that's gonna be about your only option for yeah. on-prem. Right now we have a tool, a SolarWinds tool that we've licensed already. Um, Site. I don't know if you guys have heard of SolarWinds. Not a great tool from what I understand, but maybe not Maybe not the worst tool either. Um, so I'm looking at what I can do there. So I've got a, a, something set up with one of their engineers um, to see what they can do for us. But um, the second option is to stand up the, the Elasticsearch cluster. I will, I will say that I think, I think Elasticsearch is the thing that we have seen people have the most success with. Yeah. Let me put it okay. that way. Especially okay. on and it, it's very well supported in the industry. I mean, it's going to give you a full <clears throat> monitoring solution. Um, the yeah. Dashboarding and all that kind of stuff is built in. It's really easy to create Kibana dashboards. Yeah, the Kibana pretty nice. So I um, think the other thing that you can look into, just as you're as you're thinking again about visibility into the events that are going on in your cluster, this is another place where health is again important. If you're detecting errors that you know are fatal or something like that for these types of known conditions making sure that those are health reports that are going to show up 
Um, and that gives you another way of looking instantaneously at the cluster and saying, oh, this uh, service is receiving corrupted messages, this service is uh, not meeting its performance goals, things like that. You can make, uh, you, you kind of want to make health <coughs> events anyway, because mm -hmm. those are things that you would want to stop and upgrade if they start happening during the upgrade. Right? Not only instantaneously, right. but in 5.4 and, and further, the anytime you have a health or load metric report that you call into our APIs, you'll end up generating an ET, a system level ETW event um, that you can listen for and then you can store that historically so you can see that, oh yeah, I've been healthy, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time and here's where, where I was down. Yeah, here are the blows. Yeah. So okay. the, those, those two together are probably part of the part of the solution. But yeah, Elasticsearch I think is the yeah, front run that's just most, right yeah, most common answer. What okay. is the best practice for multi-turn applications when front-end apps? Yes, sorry. Splunk. Splunk is also very good. <laughs> yeah, there's Splunk, and then there's the HP tool, but they're both rather expensive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, best practice for multi-turn applications when front-end apps are within the cluster. There are a couple of stack uh, on that. Can so you be more specific? Yeah, what's, what's the, what's what's the, the problem? problem? Is telling here the, the fact that you want all the code perfectly isolated from each other, or is it something else? Yeah, if you can give us a little bit more about, about what you're looking for, we can we can come back to that question. Uh, next question is from, uh, we are using service fabric to host our web applications, web APIs, and other microservices. In the case of web application, the debugging experience is very difficult if we need to stop, restart the Visual Studio debugger every time we change an HTML JavaScript file. Any plans to improve that experience? Let's handle that. Absolutely. Like what? Tell us yeah. more. Give me, give me. Oh, the edit refresh stuff. Yeah, it's For still web being. Web yeah, yeah, it's still being fully cooked. <laughs> <laughs> it just needs another five more minutes, and it's probably done. Do you want to describe it? Well, I think it was shown in the patterns and practices uh, show we did back in November or something like that. Basically, what we're doing is uh, we give you the option to run a the one node uh, cluster locally. And you specifically need to put your service fabric application into something we call refresh mode. So what's happening is that once you finish your debugging, the application keeps running in the cluster. And basically, the application is now not being run from the uh, official image store, but it's being redirected into the build output uh, directory of your project. So either when you do another uh, debug, it's very quick to get your changes in the service because we basically just build the services and then we go and poke the service inside the cluster so we don't actually go through a deployment and everything. Uh, what also means is that once, if you're in a debugging session and you're doing the, uh, some of the web stuff, we actually support the edit and, uh, edit and refresh experience that you have today where you can go and change CS HTML files and you just refresh the browser and all those changes are being picked up. So it's going to dramatically increase those specific scenarios. But also anything you're doing with stateless services, stateless services where you aren't changing anything like replica, number of replicas and stuff like that, um, you will get a quicker experience for doing uh, round tripping between uh, debug sessions. And that's going to come in the next release? It's going to come in the next release of the tool, yeah. Uh, in regard to continuous delivery, the VSO deploy service fabric application release task makes it equally difficult to deploy the same build for the web application to a dev QA or prod as we cannot easily modify the web config without having to recompile the build. Answer is probably tokenizer again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so the same the same tokenizer thing that we mentioned earlier, which will allow you to put a token inside that file and then plug different values in as a part of build. Um, the, um, the, the regarding the scale question, uh, yes. Just to follow up on that, I mean, the for the VSTS and, and also CFS task, we do have this one task today, the giant deploy task that sort of does everything you need but it also limits the, the, the scenarios that we're actually supporting. Uh, the one thing we're thinking about to make that easier is to provide a, uh, a PowerShell task for Service Fabric. So basically, we would give you the idea is to give you a task in VSTS that authenticates you to a cluster and gives you the cluster connection, and then you would be able to run any PowerShell script or commands within the context of that connection against your cluster. So if you have a specific scenario where you want to do only copy and registry application and you don't want to do the, uh, create applications or upgrade applications or you only want to upgrade or stuff like that, you should be able to do that providing your own PowerShell scripts. Uh, probably, so the VSTS releases are a bit off sync with everything else we release. <laughs> so um, 
I would guess a month or two from now we would have that in the SDS as well. A follow-up to the scale question, uh, where it was asking number of node cells, partitions, etc. With multi-region clusters, and back. Uh, what kind of latency does this introduce when replicas and fault domains are spread across regions? So I think <coughs> the it depends on where it's hosted. If it's hosted inside of Azure, um, then the two segments or the two portions of the cluster would end up communicating across Microsoft's backbone uh, rather than the public internet. At which point the latency isn't too bad. You can just do kind of the calculation with speed of light. If you start doing it today, though, that that connectivity doesn't exist. You'd need public IP addresses, um, and then you'd need the cluster to be spanned across all these regions. Um, there's still some hiccups in that that we're working out with the VM scale set team and the networking teams. Um, so today, the way that you'd have to build it, you'd have to use what are called Azure VNet gateways, and you'd have to have VNet gateways in all of the different regions and hook them up to each other. Um, at which point, it's still going to be routed across Microsoft's backbone, but the VNet gateway itself introduces some additional latency, especially depending on whether or not that link you also secure it. So those uh, VNet gateways today don't do SSL offloading. Uh, they have some bandwidth limitations, and that's where you start to see um, latency start to creep back in. How much latency you, you see will, of course, depend on a couple of things. The exact size and you know other, other characteristics of the data that you're sending across that link um, and also, of course, how far apart the regions really are, right? I mean, you are going to start to hit speed of light physics type problems um, when you're talking about regions that are on opposite sides of the globe. Um, but for a continental type distance, it's usually not too bad. And really, you can always tune the latency by tuning the communication and how much data you're sending across the wire and in what sizes. What you're usually getting out of this, though, is really, really great <laughs> Um, disaster recovery and resiliency. Um, that's something that I will always pay. Personally, I will always pay latency in order to get that kind of safety. Um, so it's one of those things you just kind of stand up, you experiment, you can maybe tune it a little bit, but it's going to end up being a cost because that's what you're doing to survive uh, those, those type of, type of errors. Um, there, the, I think the, the answer to the scale question change in the context of... Not really. You're trying to survive those types of failures. Um, the scale question is still... The same. same. Service Fabric is, is able to do multiple region stuff, and we have for years. Um, so if you could do this today with your own on-premises data centers and your own networking, uh, you could do that today. Um, and there's there's config that we could tell you about that, that helps you make sure that that's going to work as expected. But basically, yeah, nothing changes from Service Fabric's perspective. If you use an application gateway to expose APIs for Service Fabric, do you have to point the backend addresses to only the nodes that have the service running on it? I'm concerned if you add every node, your custom health probes would have to be very specific to the service and would show unhealthy on all nodes without that service running on it. Is this in relation to the application gateway? Yeah. No, I mean, with the application gateway, you still have to have this model of you have to have a stateless service running inside your cluster that gets exposed. Um, as endpoints for the ports that you want that you talk to from the application gateway. So you talk to the application gateway, then it talks to a stateless service. Again, it's still going through the load balancer. It's still yeah, going through yeah, the load yeah. balancer. So your load balancer still has to open up your <coughs> ports, the ports that you want, and you start to have stateless service listing on those ports, and then it round off and round um, on those particular set of services that you're running. Yeah. It doesn't um, change. We, we should publish uh, some of the next time. Yeah. That, yes. um, Doc, um, Antonio says that he has a single core, two single two core 4G BVM in Azure with a dev local cluster and a reverse proxy, and apparently has a prototype which works extremely well. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> Sit down the lab. Be nice. <laughs> um, uh, he wants to disclose the URL, uh, you know, of his app in the chat, and I think that's fine. You can. Uh, yeah. 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 Regarding yeah. the open sourcing of Service Fabric, does that imply it's going to be based on .NET Core? Uh, no, so we're 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 doing some work to uh, move all of the all of the managed code and the upper level frameworks <coughs> off of .NET Desktop and onto .NET Standard, um, but we're going to open source before before that's complete because that's going to take a little more time to do. So when we when we do go open source, it'll be what's out there currently today, which is on which is compiled against .NET Desktop or full .NET framework. What they call it these days? Full .NET framework. Yeah. yeah. Full .NET framework. Yeah. Could someone link to the... Yeah. yeah. Um, 
who could somewhat link to the GitHub repo with the VSD as example for forward versioning. Um, certainly, there is some issue. There. Oh, we still have that old GitHub repo yeah. that's out there that's empty. If you go to that, oh, though, yeah. it should point you to the real one. It does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the question is, can we find the link for the VSTS stuff yeah. and make sure it's in there? Sure. sure, we can do that. Uh, question regarding lease and arbitration architectures. As, as far as, as, as I, I recall, yes. we call the default lease time is 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, are there scenarios where the federation subsystem preempts the replica before the lease before the lease expiration to speed up the failover? Or does the little manager always need to wait for the lease? Yeah, there's no preemption or anything like that. They're very <coughs> separate layers intentionally. So all the, the least up is if you can't get a ping from that node in 30 seconds, we declare the node dead. All the nodes declare the nodes dead. And then the FM gets to figure out what failed, what was on that machine, and how to react to it. So they're, they're separate things. Uh, DLI poses another possible solution for Craig's uh, overriding. As for overriding yeah. ports. Overriding yeah. forward. Thanks, Eli. Um, uh, what is the smallest lease time configured in practical single region low latency clusters? Uh, we've seen all sorts of numbers. Five seconds Five is about seconds as low, for the low as I've seen go. people go. The, it really depends upon the network reliability. Um, with five seconds, you're not giving yourselves a lot of opportunities to, if the network blips, yes. for it to correct itself before we declare that machine dead. Um, what this results in is a lot of kind of false declarations, or not necessarily false, the network was dead during that period of time, but it becomes costly. We spend a lot of cluster resources constantly moving services around uh, to react to those failures when if you just waited maybe a second or two more, um, the nodes would, the network would heal itself and the nodes would come back and everything would be fine. Um, it's really one of those things where I would only tune the lease timer down if you're observing a lot of network blips that are impacting your application that Service fabric isn't catching, uh, and you would like it to catch, but do keep in mind that's going to cause nodes to go down, come back up, and will disrupt the running application. If your application is getting disrupted anyway, we might as well at least know about it so that so that we're taking corrective action while those network uh, issues are in, are in effect. Uh, Eli says another option for logging, going back to the Splunk uh, Elasticsearch discussion, you can use a Slab service, which is a service fabric app that collects ETW and pushes it to a HTTP endpoint for host. No, don't use Slab anymore. Use, use event flow. Yeah, actually, yeah, the event flow actually has a standard output, output yeah. which just writes to console. Uh, you can fairly easily take that and have it write to a file instead, some circular thing. Be aware of the um, of the impact of actually doing that, <laughs> writing to disks. Uh, but the event flow outputs uh, are all open source. The code is out there, so it should be pretty easy to tune that. How about some app insights integration? App insights is supported by event flow. Do you see the theme here? All right, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. And some new and some new docs that explain how it's all yeah, works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. New docs are yeah. coming back. Yeah. 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 Seriously, Todd, what are you doing? Nothing. Not the most yeah. exciting docs ever. Um, are reliable actors suitable for scenarios where I need to kick off 10k actors of the same type per second for doing a job which is one second maximum? How long will they live after that? Do I need to care about it? I'm comparing this to the actor model like in Erlang where I can start actors freely to manage concurrency. Well, you do need to worry about, you need to worry about one thing. So here, here's the problem with that. If you do 10,000 actors, actor instances per second continuously, um, so they will, you're basically just creating .NET objects and we go and garbage collect, well, we don't garbage collect, we release the reference. We let the .NET garbage collector go and reclaim um, the actor objects. The problem is, though, we make a record of every actor you instantiate on disk, and that doesn't go away unless you, do, unless you do some explicit cleanup on that, and that's our delete API. So unless you call delete actor explicitly, we keep the record of the actor on disk. And it's it's not a lot. It's it's basically just the ID. It's just a little record in a table. But, yeah, but if you ran that doing 10,000 every second, then over a period of time, your disk is going to start to fill up with all those records. So um, if you're doing that, you just have to make sure to go and explicitly yep. delete those. Just have kind of a job running in the background that's going to delete those. But other than that, yeah, I don't think it's too big. Yeah, the other thing is, yeah, it's, it's fine otherwise. Okay. If they're only doing, I mean, if they're going to last just one second, just a one second job, uh, presumably, you probably don't need them to be stateful. You're probably not replicating any data. So in that case, I would recommend. I, I would recommend. Is that me? 
Yeah, yeah I think so. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just to reinforce the point. Just to really reinforce the point. Um, <laughs> use persistence mode none, so that way we don't create replicas of them because uh, it'll, you know, if, if they're doing, if you're doing 10,000 a second and they're doing one second jobs, you're going to spend a lot of time just creating replicas, copies of each actor that you create. Yeah, you probably yeah. don't want that. So just do persistence mode none, that way you only get one copy of each one, and then it, then it should be fine. Yeah, just make sure you're doing that disk cleanup afterwards. Uh, wondering about the possibility of allowing a plugin messaging architecture for intra-fabric communication. Specifically, specifically interested in guaranteed delivery of messages. Yeah, I mean, the, the communication stack um, that your services use is completely pluggable. So we've seen people put service bus in there. We've seen people put other reliable messaging schemes in there and then use that to communicate um, both within the cluster or across other clusters or with other systems. Um, so that's that's something you can do today. The samples that we have show a few examples of plugging in HTTP as the communication stack, but you could be anything. And I think there's a couple samples out there or GitHub projects that other people have already started um, that plug in things like service bus. Uh, you can look at all of those as examples of how to how to add your own communication stack if you if you care about reliable messaging. That's a great case. Uh, and yes, this will be a recurring meeting, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time every third Thursday. Um, so yes, you can put it on. I think that's the that's the the new schedule. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, we'll we'll make sure we have that announced for you guys. Yeah. And Chris asks, can you have multiple VMSs attached to a single service fabric cluster? The answer is yes. Every node type is essentially its own. Uh, yeah, I'll publish, there's a template actually that Chaco published, um, which I'll put in the chat window, called Three Node Type Service Fabric Cluster. And I think it answers another part of this question where it was particularly focused on how you can have um, network security groups from NSG as part of one of the uh, node types. So you can effectively lock down part of your cluster so that you had your front end that have got exposed to a set of services and the back end behind the net NSG so that you can. Um, Make sure that you have more greater security around running part of your cluster. So I'll publish that in the in the window, but it shows two concepts effectively: but in, increased security as well as node types um, for using different um, VM sizes inside your cluster. Okay. So Matt has already responded and given the link. Cameron would love an actor to Azure Functions messaging plugin. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I, I guess think that's it. We're I about out of time. It. Yeah. All right. Thank oh, you, folks. Just... Thanks for the time. Thank you, everybody. See thanks. you in four weeks' time. And thanks again. And continue to post questions on other forums. Yep. And discover yep. bugs and put them in yeah. our Stack Google. Overflow, Good. Uh, the GitHub issues list, uh, anytime. Uh, we're always watching those forums. Even the MSDN for forums, we watch those too, everywhere. Equal opportunity. <laughs> but we prefer Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow and GitHub are great. Please go there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Right. Thanks, folks. thanks, everybody. See you next time. Do we have to go press? I'm done. Yeah, you're going to be in this. The magic. No, stop opening first. Okay. All done? Yes. Are you all done?